Welcome to the Animus podcast. Today we're going to be talking with Mr. Presence himself, Marcus Stone. We're going to be exploring his journey from charter surveyor to coaching training to trainer of coaches. Marcus is also going to share with us his, his top five books around presence and the here and now. He's also going to share with us how he's developing a fearlessness in his coaching practice. So it's, it's great to have you here, Marcus, and to have those amazing uh, socks with us as well. <laughs> well, they're specially here today just for you, Robert. Awesome so, stuff. Yeah. Brilliant. So um, I'm going to keep them just front and centre. <laughs> so um, I know that you're a coach, you're a trainer, and you're other things too. Mm. And I'm just curious about... How, does, how do you manage all of what you do? Oh, that's a really good question. Perhaps, <laughs> perhaps we can have a chat about that because it's really <laughs> uncomfortable. Um, so, yeah, so I've been, I mean, I've been through quite a transition in the last few years, as, as you know, um, and, and um, I talk about this um, on my presence weekend, that you know, for 28 years or so, I was a uh, chartered surveyor, five days a week in corporate and small property company environments, doing my thing and really um, just um, f almost from the word go, not feeling any kind of real fulfillment behind the work. Uh, 28 years. That's a nice chunk of time. It's a long time, isn't it? Um, yeah. And getting to the stage where really I wondered if, I, I always felt there was something for me in life, that's the first thing, uh, that there was something else. That I was meant, I was here for a reason and I was meant to be doing other work and I just couldn't, I looked outside myself for it, I could never find it. Um, I got to the stage where I just I wondered whether that work ever existed, um, and then I discovered animas and coaching. Um, a slightly odd story about how that happened, and it was just like a bolt out of the blue for me. There was suddenly there was something here which felt like it really resonated with mm. me, um, and the kind of work. And actually, interestingly, it made me reflect back on the bits of work that I had enjoyed. Um, with property okay, um, and realised that it was always about the people, it was always working with the people and a curiosity about who these people were and how I could work with them, how I could have fun um, in that environment just with people but it was never about the outcomes of the property work itself. Um, so that, to get back to your question, that's transitioned into, I've, I've kept some of that work so I gradually reduced that work down. Okay, so that's, that's, uh, I'm just going to pause you there. Just, sure. That's really interesting because uh, often I hear people talking about, you know, I'm going to stop everything mm. and I'm going to go and do this. Mm. And you made a transition Well, there. I did, but do you know what? At the time it felt really uh, uncomfortable and risky, even just transitioning. Okay. Because I was a director in a property company um, and I had a conversation with my, one of my fellow directors one afternoon over a glass of wine, sat in the sun, uh, basically telling him I discovered something else. I hadn't qualified at that stage. I was still just like halfway through the course. Okay. Uh, my life was mad because I just didn't have time to fit all of these coaching practice clients into my life. And I decided that was more important than the 28 years that had gone before and everything I'd built in that world to the extent that I just was prepared to push it all away. But what I suggested was reducing my time with Fairank, which he wasn't very happy about. But eventually we came to a compromise. So. But that, it felt quite uncomfortable mm. at the time, interestingly. But, but in hindsight, what it allowed me to do uh, was take the pressure off my development as a coach moving forward. I still had something here which, even though it wasn't fulfilling me at a personal level, was fulfilling um, a practical role in my life. It was providing yeah. me with funding. It also kept my marriage on track, probably, because my wife was able to still recognise a part of me. Okay. Even if this other part over here she didn't recognise and wasn't comfortable with. So the transition was, was helpful. So that's really interesting because often uh, when, when training new coaches, we, we can talk about this idea that you'll go through a shift, you'll go through a change, mm. and uh, people will notice that about you. So here in this, you're in your relationship, in your marriage, you'd gone from this corporate man, you were now training to become a coach, and you'd started to change. Oh yeah, I became an asshole in, <laughs> in my own living room. What does what, what, what does it, uh, um... I I became I think looking back, it felt so important to me. So the first thing was it felt really important to me, and I wanted everybody around me to know how important it was and how fantastic it was. I'd finally 
found something. Look, I told you, here it is. I finally find something here that really feels powerful to me. But secondly, then bringing my work into the home space. Um, and beginning to get a little bit coachy um, in that environment. Mm. And the combination of that, I think also, for, you know, so that was my part in it. Um, but I think um, for Sylvia, there was, um, there was this clearly the shift um, in me. She didn't recognise me. She felt, I think, the safety, stability and security that I'd represented previously uh, suddenly was, was up for grab, was, was in question, mm. let's put it that way. And the future looked uncertain, and I think that really played off her. And it led to quite an uncomfortable period, actually, looking back. Okay. Uh, which, is, which is interesting. Um, uh, despite being told this was going to happen, I just blundered in anyway and carried on. Uh, <laughs> and there we are. <laughs> <laughs> and so you, you, you went through, or I, uh, you're going through that experience, and now you're not just a coach, you're also a chain of coaches. Yeah, I know. How amazing is that? And also still doing a bit of property work as well. Still married, for anybody who's wondering <laughs> whether, how that played out. Um, so yeah, just at this moment, my life is, is quite complicated. So I, I, I took on a two, or well, it was a three day a week part-time role with the Crown Estate in property last November, at a point where really my life was moving in a completely different direction. So that was quite interesting for me, and I sort of look back at that and wonder why I did that. But what it means for me now is I've, I've gone down to two days a week. That's finishing in December. Um, I still consult for my old um, property company practice, but that's a very uh, small amount of my time now. I train for Animas. I train the presence module for Animas. And I run a part-time one-to-one coaching practice as well. So I've got a, a, a few hats there. And how I manage that is at the moment, which is quite interesting for me as a coach, pretty badly. <laughs> um, I've gone back into this kind of, particularly in the last uh, few weeks, where everything seems to have become really busy all at the same time. Um, and I'm just trying to get through. But I, I, I'm also recognising that there's some personal boundary issues around the work that I'm doing, um, which is really interesting just for me to sort of stop and, and notice all of that. Um, and notice the reaction in myself as well and when it's feeling really uncomfortable. So all of those things, I'd say I've moved on in that regard, that I'm okay. able to see that in myself now. And I know that some of the stuff I'm doing here is crossing boundaries for me around how I want to work, right. the way that I want to work, the space that I okay. need in my life to fit in in between this thing that I call structured work. So I, I say it's a work in progress. It's, yeah. it's, it sounds like a, a sort of a, a kaleidoscope of different things happening at, at different times and at the same time and I get this, all these visions of all these colours kind of merging and then separating because it feels like you you left the property world and then you kind of went back into the property yeah. world so almost like a, a dance with what you were yeah. then what you moved away from and then kind of going back into it almost like just checking to see if I it was, it was a check okay I, you know this guy rings me up from the crown estate and says I don't know what you're doing, Marcus, but we've got a 12-month maternity cover. You could come in and do this. Um, I, I think I was flattered. Um, and I thought, yeah, I could do this. And maybe this is the piece that's missing from my life. But then I stepped back into that, and within, the, on the first day, <laughs> I took myself off to the toilet at 3 o'clock in the afternoon and said, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> So how, so did you, I, <laughs> how did you then get through that? So that's your first day of a 12-month I, I contract. Uh, for the first, I, I, so I, I stopped and I said to myself, right, come on. The, you said you were going to give yourself three months of this. Because I did talk about it quite a lot. And I thought, is this the right thing to do or not? And I thought, let's make the best of this. I, I felt there was something in there that could possibly bring the sort of... Um, so I've got a slightly adverse reaction to the corporate world, I think, coming out of it. Um, and feeling that I'd got some distance away from it in my coaching work was quite nice. And there was a resistance to me going back in that direction, even though I recognised that probably I could do some great work mm. in the property industry or whatever it was. There was always a risk of resistance there. And I thought, well, maybe this is, this is where the two come together. I, it didn't happen. The le that was not the lesson for me. I think the lesson for me was, no, this is, this is, this is it. This, is, this really is time for you to... to Leave that behind and step out and become who you're going to be in this world that you love. Okay, so you, you train the presence module for Animus. I do. So how, how did that come about? 
<laughs> um, a conversation with Nick. Um, completely unexpectedly for me. I'd stayed in touch um, with Animas. I'd done a bit of work with you um, mm. and doing some webinars and stuff like that because I just wanted to stay around the whole Animas thing. Uh, there's something really interesting for me about it. And I had, Nick had a conversation with me and asked me if I'd be interested in being more involved with Animas. And he was developing uh, this expanding diploma this fifth weekend and he felt that I might be um, a good fit for it. Um, and that was it. And it so for me, it, it was just, uh, yes, <laughs> I'd be interested. And then all of the fears that come through, I'd never seen myself as a trainer standing up in front of groups. I mean, there was something about standing up in front of groups of people talking that interested me. Okay. It was a sort of loose notion that I thought, this is something that I could do. And I'd observed you in the training space. And I had thought, yeah, you know, actually, maybe there's something there for me. But in my wildest dreams, I never actually thought that it would happen. Um, so it, that's how it came about. So what was it like then, um, beginning that, that journey into uh, becoming Mr. Presence, as some people like to call you? It's terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I'm not sure, you know, there I am, first weekend in the hotel space with you, um, co-delivering the, the presence weekend, feeling anything but present um, in the space. Um, and I, f I don't know how I went. I feel like I got through that. I feel there were some good <laughs> moments in there, but that I got through it. And I was training to the next thing. So really difficult, but it was really interesting how it evolved for me. Um, and that I felt two or three weekends in that I, begin I began to find my rhythm with it. Um, it. It was interesting changing the material that suited me and that thing that I, I had to tell myself a lot was just to be me in the space. This is what it's about, is that I'm partly demonstrating um, presence and its impact on coaching just by being there in the space because this is what I do. So allowing myself to be me in the space and to have that impact was so important. And, and, and initially at least, there were definitely times where I was not allowing myself to be me in the space. Um, which is really, uh, just a fascinating lesson. Uh, so, I, I, you know, I really remember the, some of the conversations about you delivering presence and us talking about the, that that was kind of you and your style and your, your way of working, that very here and nowness to it all. Uh, and it's quite interesting hearing that actually delivering being in the here and now can actually be quite difficult. Mm. It's, yeah, the, there can be a real challenge there because, you know, and, it, and it, it's similar to coaching. And it's what I'm trying to demonstrate in the spaces. So as soon as you stop to think, what is it I'm supposed to be doing here? How am I supposed to be helping my client? How can I move them on to achieve this goal here? But, and in the training space, it's the same sort of thing. What is it I'm supposed to be doing here? How am I supposed to demonstrate this? What should I be saying next? Let's just take a step back from mm. that. Let's just be here now. And, and now I'm much more comfortable with basically coming up in those conversations that I have with students, playing with it, seeing what's emerging in the moment, talking about the stuff that comes up, because that's the essence of what's really important, is what's important now in this moment is the thing that, for me, is going to have the greatest impact. Lovely. And, I, you know, I've spoken with other people about that, that notion of emergence and how that's the thing, the thing that's coming into the space in that moment is mm. the most important thing in that moment. And mm. that's where the exploration lives. And what... what sort of uh, enabled you or led you to develop that skill to really notice that stuff? I don't know. I... <laughs> <laughs> it's the first time I've said it, Robert. <laughs> Is that good enough? No? <laughs> so uh, it, it's part of who I am. Um, it, it's an interesting question. I'm not sure because I don't think I fully recognise that in myself anyway. This was something that was spotted by Nick, really, that I had a certain way of being and a certain skill set that might be well suited to delivering something around this in mm. the training room. Um, I have a natural curiosity, I think, about people at a deeply human level. I think I'm generally working quite compassionately um, with the people that I work with. Um, and I, I have, a, I think, I mean, I don't, you know, this isn't meant to sound anything other than exploratory, but I think I have an authenticity and a genuineness about me that I feel comes across to people. 
because it is there, because it is genuine. Yeah, yeah. Um, and being able to, you know, all of the stuff that I talk about in the Presence Weekend is always caveated by, but you can't fake this stuff. The real essence of when this works is when you are genuine and you really mean it. So how do, how do uh, coaches or how do you work with coaches to get to that place? to get to that authentic curiosity and compassion? Through experience. The weekend is all about experiencing what it means to work in that way, I think. And it is a, it's a, it's a, it sits, at the moment, it sits right in the middle of the training. Um, it is a bit of a juxtaposition. It's a bit different. Um, it's, it's, it's less full on, I think, than some of the other weekends. Mm. There's more space around it. I think it's timed quite well. I think people come in having, they've done foundations, they've had all of that um, barrage of information about what a coach is and how you should be asking questions and what you should be doing. And then, oh, by the way, go away and start coaching people. <laughs> uh, then they go into cognition and it's all um, up here and it's about models and, and um, CBC and all of this stuff. And there's a lot of thinking going on and suddenly they come into the Presence Weekend and there's just much more space about it. Um, and really, it's quite hard to, for me to describe up front to people, this is what you're going to get out of this weekend. So I, I do pre-frame it with, this is an experiential weekend. Um, and it's going to, the, the learnings will emerge and they'll probably be different for different people. Um, and one of the things I, I really hope that people get from my weekend is that they wake up on the Monday morning or the Thursday morning, if it's a weekday training, and they just feel a little bit comfort, more confident about their coaching and who they are as a coach. And it allows them to stop and think, well, who am I in this space? Um, and it's okay to be me in this space. Um, and that these rules that we talk about, where is this rule book that we're talking about? One of the things I heard, uh, I had a conversation with Bronwyn, who's one of the other trainers, as, as you know, and she said that the frameworks are a playground and not a prison. That's nice. And I just really love this idea that it's, it's for us to go and play. And I think mm. one of the things that happens in presence is, or during that module, is that people are allowed to play and mm. to explore and to see what happens and to sort of find themselves within that because mm. we've kind of done all the, the frameworking and the, 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 the models and the kind of the cognitive understanding. And then we go, okay, let's just park that for a mm. moment and just explore who we are within all of this as well. Absolutely. And, and that, that it's, it's almost a stripping away during the weekend. It's really interesting that I've started to frame the exercises we do now around restraint and levels of restraint to experience what happens when you just sit back a little bit and allow things to emerge in the space rather than trying to force it. So there's a sort of three-stage process through the weekend in the exercises we do where they until it, ultimately they're forced to stop and do nothing <laughs> <laughs> and see what happens. Uh, so do you find that anybody's ever really resistant to mm. that? Yeah. The first weekend uh, we did together um, doing one of the exercises, I remember a student standing up and saying, I just don't see the point of this exercise, um, which was, oh, I found quite challenging at the time, first weekend. So anyway, I just said, go away and experience it, see what you think. And it was lovely how they came back into the space um, and talked about actually they decided to give it a go and how amazing it was that they actually realised that they got to somewhere by doing this exercise, which they would never have got to and somewhere useful if they had just been who they normally are in the coaching, which was lovely. But yes, I, so I think some people love it and some people find it challenging. I think... You know, where there's a need for something to hang on to in coaching, there's the need for a framework and uh, a, that, that, cert, that need for certainty that we have yeah. um, about how, what I should be doing next and how I do it. So if, if, you're, if you're coming into the Presence Weekend with that mindset, then I think it, it can be a bit challenging. Um, so I, if you come into the weekend with just an open mind, then it's, a, it's probably a better place to be, probably. I don't know, it's interesting. So I, I, I think it depends who you are. 
and what you're looking for. Yeah, and, and I, you know, I recognise that during the, the different uh, modules that people enjoy them more or less. Mm. And it's something that I found really uh, interesting when I was doing all of the training that I'd see people really uh, be drawn to something, say our transactions weekend, and be really pushed away by something else. And I'd say, but that's kind of a reflection of who we are and what we're uh, used to or drawn to. Mm. And, and as I think about that, I'm sort of thinking about what's, what's the sort of the, the reading or the practice that you do to kind of really cement, embed uh, your, your practice as a coach? Oh, as a coach? Oh, well, and as a trainer. Modern methods of valuation for property, <laughs> things like that. Uh, <laughs> I, have to, I have to say this year has been very turbulent for me in terms of, and one of the frustrations I've had is I haven't felt I've had the time to do more reading and listening. And that's one of the things I'm really looking forward to about next year is I have this huge pile of books on a bookshelf that I've bought because it resonated with me, all of this stuff. Uh, so what, what are your uh, top five books? Either the ones that you'd like to read or the ones that you've, you've read. If somebody was, was watching or listening to this and they're like, how do I begin to tap into this present stuff that they're talking about that seems so uh, nebulous and... Ah, oh, okay. So my, my top five, who knows if anybody else would love it. Um, the first thing that I, it wasn't a book, it was a, a film I watched, which really started to make me stop and think, and it just imbued a feeling in me, was The Shift, um, featuring Wayne Dyer. Okay. Which I discovered after he died, and I watched it, and I just was blown away about Still one of the favourite things that I've, I've got. Um, On Becoming a Person by Carl Rogers. Um, I just think it's a fascinating book, and it just adds colour to a lot of the work that we do around that weekend depth which of course we can't go into during the weekend. Um, we do some work with Nancy Klein, so I think A Time to Think by Nancy Klein is a very interesting book if you're looking at um, providing your clients with the space and time to think for themselves and to bring that empowerment forward, which is what we're trying to achieve. It's just a, it's a really interesting book um, in that regard. Five, did you say? Is yeah. that how many have I done? I must have done eight. We've, do <laughs> we've done Wayne, we've done Carl, we've done Nancy. Oh, gosh. Oh, um, uh, Brené Brown, anything by Brené Brown. Um, I've, some of the most powerful realizations I've had um, were from listening to Brené Brown, actually. And your number five book? Number five, uh, another book that really um, I found beautiful and shifted stuff for me was Irvin Yalom and Love's Executioner. I mean, God, what, a, what an amazing title oh, for a God, book that yeah. is. Um, and it really drew me in. Yeah, I love that. Something, he's, he writes beautifully, really beautiful stuff. So a part of what I'm hearing there is that there was your own sort of personality and way of being and then uh, supported by your, your reading and your practice to sort of create you as the coach that you are now and the trainer that you are that's able to sort of just stay in the space and be. And I'm wondering how do we help coaches to just allow themselves to be coaches instead of kind of forcing being a coach? That's a very good question. Um, I th I th the answer to that is, I'm not entirely sure. I think there's ways that we can help, but I think unless um, it's the same with everything, unless you, as the coach, start to recognise this. That for me, it's about getting out of your own way. Yeah. Um, it's about starting to notice when you're not being yourself in the space. So I talk a lot in the weekend about what it is that we bring into the space with us as coaches that pollutes the space. And so it's an awareness of all of that stuff. And I think for me as well, there was this this lovely realisation around coaching that actually it was, it was okay to be me for a start, that I didn't have to try and be somebody else. So I'd spend a long time in a world where I felt, rightly or wrongly, that actually I had to be somebody that I wasn't in many different situations. And it felt here that I didn't have to do that. So for me, it was like, a, it was a relief. Um, and, and, but then it was reliant upon me giving myself permission to be able to do that, step out of my own way, put my own um, fears and limiting beliefs to one side in that space and just trust that the person that I am was enough. 
Um, and I, I can't explain it any more than that. I mean, I, obviously, I still have, like, like all of us, those moments where, you know, before a session or during a session, I'll find myself out of presence and, you know, either worrying about what's happening in the mm. space or maybe thinking about something that's going on outside the space. But I'm better um, able now, more resilient, to be able to pull myself back and refocus into the space. So a lot of it is about um, awareness, I think. Yeah, I was, just, I was just about to say that. It's, there's something about how do we grow our awareness. And for me, part of that is uh, that self-reflection. So reflecting on what we're doing mm. so we can notice what we're doing and how we're being. And in that noticing, we can feel when we're pulled out of that, that present space. Yeah, and there's a lot of work that we can all do on self-awareness, <laughs> isn't there? And I, do, I usually do a slot during the weekend on what it is we might do to help ourselves become more self-aware as coaches. Yeah. Get some fascinating answers. Can you, naked uh, roaming was... Well, naked, naked roaming? Hiking. Yeah, naked hiking was one of them. And I thought it created a huge laugh, obviously, <laughs> but I thought, wow, actually, that would teach you a lot about yourself. <laughs> Putting yourself out there naked in a public space. <laughs> I know there are some exhibition artists that, that do that sort of thing. It'd be interesting to sort of naked exhibition coaching. That's, that's <laughs> naked coaching. That's a whole... Wow, you could be the naked coach. How about that? You might be truly present. I'm not sure you're flying. <laughs> That's a, a whole um, yeah. another pathway that we, we Maybe. could go down. There's a niche. <laughs> but before we sort of travel down that road, <laughs> no, um, I need to, I need to, I need to, I need to get this down now. It's so um, you you were uh, one of the hosts at the Animus Summit, um, and you uh, did the uh, uh, social impact panel. Yeah. Um, and I'm just, you know, how, how did you find being at the, at the Animus Summit? How did you find working with that panel? Oh, I loved it. I loved it. It's the third summit that I've been involved with now. I mean, there's an interesting thing about presence, actually. Um, I think the first summit I prepped to the nth degree, uh, questions I might ask and how, you know, how I was going to work it. And it to the, to the extent that actually I walked on stage that day without having pre prepared at all for either that or for, because I did um, a one-on-one -on -one interview with Nick as well. Um, and so that, for me, that was really interesting that I was able to walk into that space and just genuinely allow whatever happened, happened. I had one or two questions in my mind um, that I could ask, and that was it. Uh, so no, I love the day. I think the energy that comes uh, from the summit is just fantastic. I think there's something for everybody. I know I go away from those days thinking, yeah, this is, this is amazing. I think the highlight for me um, was the last slot with Liz. I took a huge amount away Liz from that. Liz, good child, yeah. And, we, you know, we talk, you know, there's me talking about allowing myself to be me in the space, but she was a fantastic reminder of that again. I thought, you know, there's a whole new level to this stuff. It feels so genuine coming from her. Something really lovely about that. Um, but no, I, it, was a, it was a really great day, really energising, I think. It's so good to be back in that space with that pool of people and feel the energy that yeah. comes. You're in a room with hundreds of coaches, it's just, and they're all interested in coaching and learning and developing and building their practice or working with their clients or building their business. There's just so many questions, such vibrancy in that space. I know, I know. It's, it's um, yeah, I, I, I loved it. And interviewing Nick, that was interesting. Yeah, that was a fascinating experience and uh, feeling, you know, talk about energy, the passion. He was so seriously passionate yeah. about his business, which was fascinating. And to get a chance to ask him some questions. Um, and there was a feeling in me, how far can I go here before he <laughs> leans over and lamps me? Well, fortunately, we didn't get, I think I was just far enough away that he wasn't able to do that. So what was, so... It, it, you know, what was, was there a key takeaway from that interview with Nick for you? Was there a, or an essence of something? Yeah. And it's something that's come up um, again and again, actually, over the last few weeks, is this, this idea of fearlessness. Uh, and I love that. And I, I, it's a growing edge, as we might say, in my own coaching practice. Um, it's, it's, I often talk about my own coaching. I often think that people want three things from me in essence, the kind of people I work with. They want to be listened to, mm -hmm. they want to be understood, and they want to know that, that, that it's okay. 
you know, that that is okay. And out of that comes a form of acceptance around who they are. And the unlocking of that acceptance can then lead to change moving forward. Once you recognise who you are and you're able to accept that, that it's okay. And if it's okay to be this, then it's okay to be that as well. And what is it I really want to do? Um, and the thing that I learned from Nick in that, or that was growing in me, was this idea of challenge. So how can I bring a little bit more challenge into my coaching with compassion and fearlessness? And how do you combine fearlessness and compassion? And for me, that feels like a really important thing um, to, to be able to discover and enhance in my own coaching pra practice. Fearlessness, compassion. No, that's not right, is it? Uh, something like that. And compassionate <laughs> fearlessness. Compassionate something fearlessness. Like that. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Like that. Like yeah. that. So, you know, so I know, I, I know you, and I know that next year there's, um, or this year you're starting your training uh, role at Animus. That yeah. that's kind of building. So, what else is happening for Marcus? Uh, it's so the property world's going left. Uh, the training world is growing, which is great. Uh, I have a little bit of space left in my life to grow some other stuff, but I also recognise it's important for me personally to have that space in my life and sometimes that it's okay for me not to be doing anything. Um, and I need that space and I benefit from that space. So for me, there's going to be a continuing balance to be found. Um, I, want to, I want to do some writing. I would love to do uh, some more speaking outside the training room and find a way for... Um, a voice within me to be heard. I'm not sure what that voice is or where it's going to be heard. So there's a growing feeling that there's, there's something um, there for me. My own coaching is quite an interesting one because I initially thought, yep, yeah, I'm going to grow my coaching as well. And actually, I don't feel that I want to grow my coaching now. I just want to enhance the level of coaching that I'm doing right now and keep it as that, that, that bit of work with maybe three or four clients. And I'm just going to be working with that number of people and no more. And that's going to fit quite nicely with who I see myself moving forward next year. But really, the, the big growth area for me um, is, is going to be the training, is continuing to grow as a trainer, um, to be having more exposure to the students with Animas and helping to grow Animas um, as a coaching brand and a school. And to, you know, to be involved with that uh, is just, just fantastic. So. Yeah, it's going to be so a great time. To it. Yeah. So yeah. looking forward to it. And so recognising uh, that you want your own space and you're going to be busy with Animus and training, if people want to get hold of you, uh, where might they find you? Uh, they can find me on Facebook. Uh, I only have one page. It's me. Um, I have a website, which is marcusstone.com. Uh, and you can find me through Animus as well, I guess. So uh, I'm there. Cool. Give me a call. Brilliant. Happy to talk. It's been amazing talking with you, Marcus. Oh, thank, thank you, you so much. Been a really great experience. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks. Okay.